Voyager 1 is in trouble. Voyager 1, the little spacecraft that could, is using a transmitter that hasn't been used since 1981. This is honestly an amazing thing that this spacecraft was built in such a robust way that after the coldness and the intense radiation environment that Voyager 1 is in, instruments and components that have been turned off for decades can be turned on and they work. I don't want to take away from that because it is absolutely amazing. But the focus on that aspect has de-emphasized what I think is a very serious communication issue with Voyager 1. To the point where if the team can't figure out a way to fix it, the Voyager 1 mission will be over. Let's dive into what's going on with Voyager 1 and whether this is the end of an almost 50 year mission. I'm Swapna Krishna and today on Ad Astra, we're going to talk about Voyager 1 and why this new issue may be the most serious one the aging spacecraft has ever faced. You may remember a huge communication problem with Voyager 1 that was resolved earlier this year. This spacecraft was sending gibberish back to Earth and engineers had to figure out how to fix the problem. It was a big deal and even the Voyager 1 team wasn't sure they could get the spacecraft operational again. I have a whole in-depth video on the entire thing from start to finish. It felt like a miracle fix and it really is a cool story, so check that out if you're interested. But the short story is that engineers figured out that a computer chip on Voyager 1 had failed and had to send instructions to the spacecraft on how to store its data in chunks to route around that. Once they did, the probe began sending back real data and the team was able to slowly turn the science instruments back on. But that wasn't the end of Voyager 1's woes this year. The thruster performance was also degrading. You will not be surprised to know that I have an in-depth video about how the NASA JPL team swapped the thrusters on the probe from 15 billion miles or 24 billion kilometers away. I am not ashamed to admit that I have an emotional attachment to the twin Voyager spacecraft, hence the reason I try to cover them as often as possible here. So what now you might be asking? Well, this was yet another communications issue, but it's different than what we've seen from Voyager 1 before. The spacecraft autonomously switched off one of its radio transmitters, and the team at JPL is still trying to figure out why it happened. Here's what we know and what we think we know. On October 16th, the Voyager 1 team sent a command to turn on one of the spacecraft's heaters. I spoke with someone at NASA to find out why, and basically the circuits in one of Voyager 1's computers are beginning to degrade because of age and exposure to radiation. The team was trying to warm them up with a heater, which they hoped would trigger a process called annealing in order to improve performance. Annealing is a process of heat treatment that can do various things depending on the circumstances in which it's used, including restore the original properties of materials and therefore reverse radiation damage. The team was flipping on this heater to warm up these specific circuits. They did the math and they were certain they had enough power available when they sent that command on October 16th. Now, anytime any instructions are sent to Voyager 1, the spacecraft sends back engineering data describing how it responded to that command. There's no working model or test bed of Voyager 1's computers anymore, so the team is very reliant on this engineering communication to understand how Voyager 1 is executing commands. Sometimes in the past, NASA has actually used Voyager 2 as a test to see how Voyager 1 will respond to commands because Voyager 1 is further into interstellar space and therefore considered the more valuable spacecraft in mission. Round trip travel time for a signal to Voyager 1 is approaching 46 hours, almost 23 hours each way. But on October 18th, the NASA JPL team discovered that the Deep Space Network wasn't picking up Voyager 1's return signal. They were out of contact with Voyager 1. The spacecraft usually uses an X-band radio transmitter to talk with Earth, and the Deep Space Network couldn't find that specific X-band signal. The team then sifted through the signals that the Deep Space Network was receiving and found a lower rate X-band transmission from Voyager 1, which confirmed their suspicions. The command to turn on the heater had triggered Voyager 1's fault protection system. As a result, Voyager 1 switched to a lower power mode of communication, the fault protection system is automatic and it can be triggered for various reasons. One of them is if the spacecraft 
overdraws on power, Voyager 1 will automatically turn off systems to prioritize the health of the spacecraft. The twin Voyager spacecraft are powered by radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. The versions on Voyager 1 and 2 are specifically called multi-hundred watt radioisotope thermoelectric generators, and they were developed specifically for this program. Each generator uses 24 pressed plutonium-238 oxide spheres to generate heat that, at the time of launch, provided 157 watts of power. Each spacecraft is equipped with three of these RTGs for a total of 470 watts at launch. They're called generators, but really they're just nuclear batteries. As the plutonium-238 decays, it creates waste heat that's converted into energy. It's a great energy solution for a spacecraft for which fuel cells, chemical batteries, or solar power just aren't really feasible, but there's a downside. Every single year, as the plutonium decays, the twin Voyager spacecraft lose about 4 watts of power. This means that at this point, Voyager 1 has 220 watts available, or about 47% of its original power left, according to the person at NASA I spoke with. This has huge implications for the future of the spacecraft, because the available power to operate science instruments is expected to run out by around 2030, at which point NASA will shut off all science instruments for the twin spacecraft. But as long as Voyager 1 can continue to point itself towards Earth with its thrusters, it's supposed to send back telemetry and engineering data, hopefully through 2036, at which point it will travel beyond the range of what the Deep Space Network can pick up with its X-band transmitter. Okay, so let's go back to the transmitter issue. Voyager 1 was sending back an X-band transmission at the lower rate, but the spacecraft did appear to be stable. The team started troubleshooting what was going on, but then, on October 19th, the X-band transmission stopped abruptly. Based on their correct assumption that the original X-band transmission issue had been triggered by Voyager 1's fault protection system, they concluded that it had been triggered twice more, and as a result, Voyager 1 had switched to its S-band transmitter, which hadn't been used since 1981. The S-band transmitter uses less power than the X-band, but it also sends a much weaker signal. That's why it stopped being used after Voyager 1 completed its primary mission in 1980. At this point, the Voyager 1 team wasn't even sure they'd be able to detect the S-band signal. It's just so weak, and Voyager 1 is 15 billion miles or 24 billion kilometers away. But the little spacecraft that could managed to send a strong enough signal with this S-band transmitter that engineers at the Deep Space Network were able to pick it up. That's basically where we are now. The Voyager 1 team sent a transmission on October 22nd to Voyager 1 to confirm that the S-band transmitter is working properly. They received an affirmative response on October 24th. Now they have to figure out why the fault protection system triggered and whether it's safe to try and turn the X-band transmitter back on. It is amazing that the spacecraft was able to make this transmitter switch automatically and that the S-band transmitter is still working. But this is not a good situation for the long term. A spokesperson at NASA told me that if they cannot turn the X-band transmitter back on, then the Voyager 1 mission is effectively over. The S-band transmitter is not powerful enough to send telemetry, let alone science data. There is no engineering data coming back to take a look at the health of the spacecraft. All they can really do with the S-band transmitter is keep Voyager 1 pointed at the Earth and send commands to the spacecraft. If they cannot get the X-band transmitter working again, then we will be saying goodbye to Voyager 1. I don't want to start predicting the demise of the spacecraft, because it seems like every time any of us start despairing about Voyager 1, the amazing team at NASA figures out a way to keep it going. But I also know that the clock is ticking, and that each of these serious problems could be the spacecraft's last one. Engineers were hoping to keep Voyager 1 operational through its 50th anniversary in 2027. I'm just really hoping that at this point that happens. I'm going to end with what the NASA spokesperson told me in an email, because I don't think I could say it any better. I'll emphasize that of course these probes have lasted so much longer than we expected, and the engineering team has been absolutely amazing keeping them going. 
The current mission is all gravy, and we expect there to be frequent issues, so none of this is unexpected. We'll keep them going as long as possible, but we will not be surprised when the mission ends. For now, that is all I have to tell you about the amazing spacecraft Voyager 1. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.